Uh, Mr. Chairman, sir, thank you for allotting me the time. I would like to join the other members of this August House in participating on the debate on Governor's address. I would like to be brief and would like to just focus on a few points. But the most important part is that uh, as we look at the Governor's address, it gives it gives us an insight into the overall strategy in respect of various policy matters relating to various programs and policies of the government and their effective implementation thereof. Now, uh, we look at multiple sectors and we, through this address, get an insight, not just get an insight into the programs and policies of the government, but also draw a sense of confidence and joy and happiness by seeing as to how many programs which are being implemented are capable of addressing the concerns of people from all walks of life, to take concern of the various developmental disparities across the state, and the commitment of the government to really be able to give a very effective, accountable governance with complete transparency, without any nepotism, favoritism, to ensure overall development and progress of the state for the benefit of the people, for the larger good of the people and larger interests of the state. Now here, government after government in the preceding years have embarked upon a number of initiatives to achieve this objective, to ensure that the government of the day, the people who are privileged to be in the authority, remain committed to ensure that every program and policies that is embarked upon and implemented are implemented in a manner that benefits all with complete disparity and if there is a disparity to address the concerns of disparities and ensure that the most important component of governance in democracy is always adhered to. The sense of accountability through an effective mode of governance where transparency prevails, accountability is considered as paramount responsibility of the government. Now when we look at all those endeavors of the preceding governments which has been put in place to ensure that, we expect the government of the day to further amplify that effort, to further amplify that endeavor. But on the contrary, what is happening is that whatever has been achieved by the preceding government with the sole intent of achieving that achieving a kind of situation where we are able to create a perception that this government is really committed to ensure that whole commitment to provide effective and transparent governance. We were one of the few states who embark upon a number of new initiatives, and we were known for that as a state. And one very important legislation, piece of legislation which was considered by this August House was carried by national media, commanding the state and the legislative assembly and the members of this August House to ensure a real-time auditing of various programs being implemented by various line departments across the state. In fact, this was carried by a number of national media commanding the effort of the state, saying that Meghalaya is the first state to embark upon this kind of legislation which will enable the government to have a 
complete monitoring and auditoring of various programs in the process of implementation on a real-time basis. We do have auditing system already laid down, but most of them are more like post-mortem. After schemes have been implemented, we'll end up identifying certain irregularities in the process of implementation, and it is more like a, a, an exercise where we need to then point a finger at the concerned authorities or the officials who must have been responsible for such omission and commission, and the penal clause thereof to take action on such officers or even the authorities. Now, <clears throat> what has happened is that the government has, government of the day has very, uh, I don't know the intent why, has completely suppressed and oppressed those endeavors. The Meghalaya Community Participation and Social Audit Act. And on the mandate of these, we have the Meghalaya Social Audit Society, which have been, as part of the initiative, entrusted with some, this social auditing as per the mandate of the law, particularly to some departments. What has happened? Why is it? Is this law not capable of empowering the people who are in authority? who are vested with the responsibility of governance to have access to informations about what is going on on real-time basis. It gives so much of power for the people who are in the hand of affairs of governance, to the HODs and to the minister concerned. So if we look at one by one, what has happened to the institution? The institution which was an offshoot of a legislation in this August House, which was again in response to the general demand of the people of this great state of ours to have a body institution to create a deterrence to any attempt to engage in any kind of irregularities or in other words corruption the lok ayukta no mention here no mention about the intent of the government to further strengthen them so it is completely an indication of what are the programs available and are being implemented. The same thing will come in the budget presentation. We would like to see that the government is committed to ensure transparency and accountability in the process of implementation of all these programs. The preceding governments have already put things in place through legislation. A legislation which was enacted by everyone, which was agreed to by everyone in this August House, by the preceding House. Do take cognizance of these wonderful initiatives and put them in place and be more effective and more accountable. Then when we look at the denial mode of the government on many things, I would like to only indicate to one particular thing, where is the indication of accepting omission or commission. We must be able to rather accept both triumph and failure. We cannot expect ourselves to be always be triumphant. There will be failures. There will be instances of omission and commission. Why is it not possible for the government? A government which represents the people to accept areas of failure. Because that will indicate that, okay, government has taken, acknowledge, uh, you know, taken cognizance of such failures, omission and commission. Therefore, we can expect the government of the day to take corrective measures. Corrective measures for what? Corrective measures for the larger good of the state and the people. Nothing else. But here, in the most important part, where we always give a categorical statement to instill confidence amongst the people, instill confidence in the minds of the people of the state 
and also instill confidence in the minds of people from outside the state, across the nation, to have the right kind of perception about the state, keeping in mind our responsibility to uphold the dignity and honor of the state, the prestige of the reputation of the state. Here you look at para four, home and political. One of the lines, all national days were observed in a befitting manner, keeping in mind the 20, uh, keeping in mind the 75th year of independence of our country and 50th year of our statehood. Not only us, the people of the state, were witness to what happened on the Independence Day. The whole country, the whole world, saw what was happening. So maybe the government of the day didn't know how to script it appropriately, didn't know how to put the language, the words. The best thing is to be on a denial mode. I'm sorry. That means the government has not taken cognizance of what is going wrong. There is no intent whatsoever to correct things. I'm sorry, we are human. To err is human. And when we run government, when we are in the helm of affairs of governance, I have always said that it's the toughest job. Yes, it is tough. Therefore, there are bound to be mistakes. There are bound to be omissions and commissions, but what is important is to acknowledge, take cognizance of them and have corrective measures, but not on denial mode all the time. Similar thing happens. Similar thing happens. Now on police recruitment. We are talking about police. And the state is privileged to know the statement of the government coming to none other than the Home Minister, confessing that there are shortages of manpower in police organization. We all know every year, on an annual basis, how many posts ultimately become vacant. And how we can actually create that space for absorbing or employing people who are running from pillar to post in search of job in the government sector. And how many applicants we receive. There used to be a problem of law and order when the application for police recruitment are distributed. There were a number of occasions when police had to actually control and contain the kind of situation which was going out of hand when everybody was so desperate to get the application forms. And at one point of time, I remember when the application forms had to be reprinted because the applicants overshoot the number of expected aspirants. This is the reality. We can't get away from reality. We can deny the reality. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, sir, if we are taking cognizance of the experience of all these young men and women, I'm talking only about police recruitment in police organization. Please look at section 29 of the State Police Act 2010, subsection 5. What does it say? There's a binding responsibility of the government to ensure transparent recruitment. The written exam has been already completed on 26 and 27. Which type of recruitment system has the police department adopted that results of the written exams are not yet posted in the website? What is happening? Who is manipulating? And for what? For whose interest? This needs to be investigated. Please do not push our youth to the wall. Because the moment there is a doubt about the transparency in the process of recruitment, it will send a wrong signal. That's precisely the reason why during our time we embark upon this legislative exercise. And we have the State Police Act 2010. And we have adopted the transparent recruitment policy. And the whole process has been laid down. And the law says, what is the binding responsibility of the government? So I want an answer from the government. What is the reason for delay of putting this result? 
who is manipulating and for whose interest. Many of the youth who are the applicants and aspirants have started asking us questions because it has never happened in the preceding recruitments. So they know that immediately. So you need to insulate also the elected representatives. What do we tell to people who are aspire, aspirants or the applicants? Because the system has been laid down in such a transparent manner, nobody can be blamed. Nor the MLS, nor the elected representatives, unlike in the past. I'm sorry, in the past, there were instances of reported irregularities, allegations of nepotism and corruption. Even when we were in power, when we were in the helm of affairs of governance, and we took cognizance of those concerns and immediately came up for course correction so that we can instill confidence and trust amongst those job seekers so that nobody will be questioned, none of us will be questioned. Today we are being questioned. The government of the day is being questioned. Is it good? We should not provide any space for the youth of the day who are so desperate to get jobs to have any doubt in the whole process of any recruitment. Same doubts are being expressed in the process of recruitment by MTSC. Some of our people have started saying that there is nepotism. Nepotism, why? Because during our time, we have ensured that all the members of the MTSC are appointed based on a transparent manner with no scope of having a perception that there was some kind of political inclination to identify any member who was appointed as a member of the MPSC. And this was, again, based on the overall felt need of the people. The civil society, organizations of the state, arts upon the government, please have a select committee or kind of a search committee so that the members of the state public service commissions who are appointed can be considered and perceived as people who have been searched by the search committee free from any political interference and therefore will have the scope of instilling confidence amongst the people, amongst the job seekers. Today we see that these trust and confidence have been completely broken because people are asking questions. Some people even come and say that, okay, we heard that some manipulation can be done. Manipulation to manipulate the results. People are moving around. People are coming. Why? Because there is a perception created. So please undo this perception by putting in a place so that we dispel this doubt. I'm urging earnestly, with utmost sense of sincerity, because otherwise we will be painted by the same brass, I and you, all of us, including people who are in the process of, or rather who are vested with the responsibility of screening and completing their responsibility of recruitment. So Mr. Speaker, sir, all this absence of good intent in the whole address by the Honorable Government is reflection of the government's that the government has completely disconnected itself from those very important aspects of governance in terms of their responsibility, the binding responsibilities of instilling confidence and ensuring that whatever the government does is con con uh, perceived as something which is for larger good of the people without any element of favoritism, nepotism, or any chances of irregularities and corruption. I would like to therefore urge the government. Now in terms of law and order and administration of justice and all, last year after my repeated 
submission requests, both inside the House and outside the House, that Honorable Chief Minister called for the State Security Commission. Now, what is happening in the state is a matter of concern. The accountability of the officers in the police organization is a matter of concern. The accountability and the real compliance of the officers concerned thereof is a matter of concern. Go by section by section of the State Police Act 2010. And the responsibility is vested on the State Security Commission. That will help the government. That will help each one of us. These are exhaustive and is capable of giving us the right kind of direction. These legislations have been directed towards achieving that goal. Here, the appoint of, appointment of DZP. What is happening? The head of the police organization, the State Security Commission is expected to be called even when there is an indication of vacancy of DZP or an indication of retirement of the person who is occupying that post. This is a complete dereliction of the government vis-a-vis -vis the mandate of the law, the requirement of the government to abide by law. It's a violation of law, the law which has been passed by this August House. It's a violation of this law. These laws cannot be violated. The government can be challenged as per the mandate of the law for violating the law. What will people say when we are caught napping that, okay, these guys didn't even read the law, that they have been caught, that they have been summoned by the judiciary? There's a judiciary intervention by the judiciary. Mr. Speaker, sir, in the instances of other allegations and irregularities, there's no indication whatsoever by the government to indicate any element of sincerity to even say that they are concerned about those concerns of the people, that the concerns of the people have drawn their attention. Today, unfortunately, there is a judicial intervention on those issues. What does it indicate? The indications are loud and clear. That means we have been found to be wanting. I think we should not be found to be wanting. We should be seen as people who are committed to our commitment, our commitment to our beloved people, the commitment which generates the kinds of hopes and aspirations amongst so many people whom we represent. And therefore, these instances of whether deliberate or intentional or by default due to these important issues not drawing the attention of the government that these important aspects were not found in the lines of this very important document, the address of the honorable government which revolves around the commitment of the government pertaining to the implementation of various policies and programs and any new initiatives embarked upon thereof by the government. Therefore, there's a need for us. I read one newspaper where the acting DGP says that the story about money from illegal mining and illegal transportation of coal is going to the hands of people who belong to some militant outfits. The statement carried was that it's an old story. I have the copy of the affair lodged by the Nokma of Nengchigen, who has clearly in the affair indicated that some armed personnel are coming and threatening and they are also engaged in collecting. Every day, whatever affair is lodged comes to the DZP and the Chief Minister and the Home Minister and the Governor. 
in the form of DSI. How is it not possible for the DGP and uh, uh, the members of the cabinet not to know about what is happening? Every day, any accident in any road will come to the chief minister and the home minister and the honorable governor in the form of DSI. What has happened to them? Aren't they reading them? To keep pace with what is happening and to know what is happening. A phone call to a village will tell you how many people are there, where are they. A phone call to one village where some boys who have surrendered earlier are deciding to find out whether they are at home or missing for last three months will tell you. Somebody will say that, sir, these two guys have been missing for last three months. What does it indicate? Mr. Speaker, sir, there, the government is equipped with all those wherewithals to know what is going on. But I know the priorities have changed. Therefore, the focus thereof. I know what is happening. The people of the state know what is happening. But please take recourse to correction. I would appeal once more to you, Mr. Speaker, sir. As I speak, when people listen, they know what I mean. And all of us, we know what we mean. Our job is to fulfill our purpose as government servants, as public servants. And we are covered under that definition. Therefore, our commitment to our people will generate the kind of trust and confidence amongst the people in our system, in our system which we call democracy. The trust of the people on our system of democracy should not be shaken by what we do. Rather, ours should be a job to instill confidence and restore confidence if it is missing, if there is a re reason for us to believe that it's slowly diminishing, we must restore them. We still have time for this government until we hit the road for our campaign in 2023. Today, if we look at the House, the number of the members in the opposition has shrunk. Shrunk. Immediately after the election, 2018, one of our colleagues, one of our elected representatives was a victim of that whole political manipulation, which does not augur well for the state and for democracy. One of the MLA was, by whatever means and mechanisms, though we all know, convince one of the MLAs to resign. Is it a good, healthy sign? Let us not embark upon this kind of unhealthy practice because the whole world is watching us. For the first time in the history, there is a tendency of the government of the day to slowly try to weaken and weaken and weaken the opposition. How does it help the state? How does it benefit the people? Therefore, the vibrancy of our democracy remains on those values to which we are committed to, the values, the core values of our democracy. The core values of democracy should not be trampled upon by us just to be in power. Because, as I have said, there should be rejoice in both triumph and failures. We should treat both triumph and failures equally, not differently. Because as we serve people, we will have both. Notwithstanding where we are, our job remains the same. We are directed towards the same responsibility. So, Mr. Speaker, sir, with these few words, I would like to urge upon the government to restore the confidence of all of us. Not only theirs, we also should have the confidence on the government and their intent. So with these few words, Mr. Speaker, sir, I thank you for giving me time and I resume my seat.